Hi guys and welcome back. This is Mrs of Mr and Mrs Gamer here and we are going to be continuing with Choice of the Deathless today which is the text-based choose your own adventure game. Uh, this is still only the demo, I didn't get to finish it last time but hopefully I will today. If you guys like what you see and you want us to buy the full game and continue doing the walkthrough for you then by all means drop us a comment and we'll see what we can do. But for now we're just gonna finish the demo and without much ado I will get on to narrating it for you. Speaking of rents and commutes and similar topics, what kind of life are you living exactly? By which I mean, when you left the hidden schools to embark on this path of high thalmurtigy, you were carrying about 150,000 thalms in debt. Currently, your soul's only worth about 2,000. Your salary is 160,000 thalms. Let's say 100,000, after all your various fees and obligations to the city of Shakur are handled. Debt, obviously, is debt. The hidden schools lay claim to your soul and all its future products. As long as you carry this debt, you'll never be free. Mad necromancers can, and will, hunt you to the ends of the earth. So, that said, how much of your salary after you take care of rent and living expenses goes towards debt and how much of it is yours to spend? So you get three options. Basically you can either decide that you want to completely erase your debt, even if you have to eat instant noodles for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, the second option is, there's no sense making myself miserable and you balance repaying your debt with your own wants and needs. And the third option is basically that you want to live up a little and you'll have plenty of time to pay the debt later. I'm going to pick the first one. I want that debt gone. I'll eat instant noodles for five years if I must. Your apartment is a mess of boxes, piles by the door, in the hall, in the centre of the room. You have a bed and pillows, but that's the limit. Everything else is cardboard and packing tape. You glance ruefully at your watch, set down your briefcase and start unpacking. At this rate, you might have time to do something other than unpack and go to the firm function sometime around two months from now. Though that's an optimistic estimate. You manifest a knife out of your own soul stuff and start tearing open boxes. You'd have used something more prosaic, but your knives and scissors are, of course, packed. Damn it. You haven't looked at your watch in a while when you hear a knock on the door. Answering it, chain in place of course, you discover to your surprise Ashley Wakefield. You haven't seen Wakefield since graduation. You sort of hoped to see, never to see him again. Ash Wakefield of the Southern Wakefields the scion of a, of a high family, and everyone in the hidden schools knew it. Affluent, blonde, brilliant, and sculpted out of marble, metaphorically, though you never got close enough to check. Calethras Albrecht and O, oh, one of the world, world's most prestigious craft firms, hired Wakefield straight out of the hidden schools as an associate in their Shikor office and he made certain everyone knew. Perhaps he was just excited. That would be a charitable way to look at it. Cavendish, he says. It's been quite a while. Since we're both going to this party, I decided I might as well visit another lonely and bereft graduate in this dismal city. It doesn't seem right to keep Wakefield waiting outside, so you undo the lock on the door, step aside, and let him in. He glances around the piles of boxes without betraying the slightest hint of disdain. Wakefield conveys disdain quite well enough without having to betray it. 
and you get four options. Um, how did you get this address? See anything you like? I'm a bit busy, if you don't mind. Or, I knew I should have shut the door in your face. Well, I guess I'm going to go with number one. All of the others seem a bit too confrontational for me. How did you get this address? I prevailed, he says, upon our alumni office, said I wanted to help grow the hidden school's community in Shikor. Do you? We'll see. Wakefield turns on his heel to face you and spreads his arms wide. I came to invite you to dinner. I have been forced to attend this particular brand of interfirm madness and drinks and a vague excuse for an intelligent conversation might provide an appropriate stimulant for the early evening. And you have four options here. You can say that you have plans, which you do, that you're meeting some friends for dinner and that he's welcome to come with you, that you'd be happy to go but begrudgingly, and you can say rather straightforwardly, no. Um, I'm probably going to go for the second option. I'm meeting some friends for dinner. You're welcome to come. Flattering, Wakefield says, much as I would relish being immersed in your social pool. And from his tone of voice, you can tell he means the shallow kind with cattails around the edge and vague green scum on top and an unpleasant stench hanging about. I shall keep my own company. Another time, perhaps. Another time, you say, and escort him to the door. You arrive at the horseshoe a few minutes after seven and shoulder your way through the barside crowd past the hostess's stand into the dining area. Fortunately, you see Cass before the hostess catches up with you. She half stands, waves and smiles. Pat turns too and smiles even broader, but he doesn't stand, doesn't wave. He's a big guy, a slow mover, but smart. Older than you and Cass too. Old for an associate. Dignified, short curly hair, dark skin, Iskari scuffs on his pressed shirts. He has a family, even, from what you've heard. A wife at home and a kid on the way. The waitress swings by. What'll you have? And you can pick a selection of lovely beverages. You can have beer, wine, whiskey straight up, a manly cocktail, an apple teeny or some tea. Well, I would have beer, but, you know, it's probably more refined to have wine. No, I'll just go with beer. I'll get right on that, says the waitress. You drink and eat and talk, and before long the conversation turns, as it always does, to work. This time the subject is goals and specifically Cass Chen's lack of them. I don't know, she says. Working for the firm develops skills and connections and all that, but in the end, so much of what we do is abstract them to... is abstract. Can't pronounce that word. It doesn't connect to people, to human lives. What does it matter if a concern recognises an extra percent of profit? To the many who work for that concern, Pat replies, an extra percent of profit, or a fraction of it, might matter a great deal. And regardless, we must think of our own lives and careers before we ponder abstract injustice. It is enough, I think, to care for our families and for those close to us. When the world's suffering, Chen shakes her head. What do you think, Ailing? What do you want out of your work with the firm? Mm, this is getting a bit ethical, isn't it? You get four choices here. 
we can say you want to make partner with the firm you'd like to give something back to the world if you can as long as they keep giving me interesting work you'll be happy to do it or you want to amass infinite power and laugh over the corpses of my enemies well then um I think I think I'm going to pick option number three. As long as they keep giving me interesting work, I'll do it. But you must have some objective, Pat says, otherwise you are simply a tool in the hands of those greater than yourself. Right now, you say, my objective is to learn. Plenty of time for all that other stuff later. Chen frowns. That other stuff is the rest of your life. Like I said, plenty of time. And if I learn enough, my life could last forever. I, Pat says, will make partner. Once I have established a place for myself and my family in this city, then my children can concern themselves with personal gratification. Not to mention this nebulous giving something back with which Cassowary seems so concerned. Now you're just being mean, Cass says. And it's not like I don't want to succeed. I just think there's more we're supposed to do here than try to get as big as we can until we explode. Pat raises his beer in a salute. Bigger is better. You know what I mean, Cass says. Not really. The conversation spins on for a while. But time is wasting and you're all more than fashionably late already. You get the check and head out to casino night. Varkarth, Kalferas, Albrecht and Al and other firms have rented out a swanky waterfront restaurant. A chandelier dangles from thin gold chains over a room, swarming with craftsmen and craftswomen clad in pinstripes and slick silk. Cocktail glasses clink. Dice thud and roll over green felt tables. Everywhere you hear the flushed bird sound of shuffled cards. Outside and overhead, a few stars have survived the onslaught of the city lights. They glitter over the black waters of the lake. You wander the floor for a moment to take everything in and score a drink from the bar. When you turn back, you take an inventory of the room. The ever practical Pat Nagab is playing blackjack, the best odds on the floor given perfect play. Cass Chen flits from conversation to conversation. She's on her second cocktail of the night, not counting her dinner drinks. This may not end well for her. Ashley Wakefield should be milling with the rest of the KAA crowd, standoffish and superior as always, but he's not. You find him at one of the po poker tables. Seated next to... Oh, gods. That skeleton in green, with the hands of cold iron and the glyphs burning on the pate of his bared skull, and the mask of cured leather. That's Golan Varkarth, as in the named partner Golan Varkarth. You've seen his portrait, but you've never seen him in person before. So what do you do next? And you can either decide to mill around for a while and talk to some people. You can try to network with the senior partners. You can win all the souls you can. You can find a true test of my mental fortitude. Or you could head straight for the poker table. Well, it didn't seem she really liked Ashley Wakefield. However, the guy who runs the company is sitting at the poker table, so that might be a good option. So is trying to network with the senior partners. Now I'm going to head straight for the poker table. You join Varkarth, Wakefield and a few other monsters at the table. The goddess of the game hovers above the felt shifting and glorious, 
calling each player in turn to his or her destruction. No sense waiting, you sit down. Wakefield looks up from the cards. Decided to button up your trousers and play in the big leagues? You can either say, shame you can't play as good a game as you talk. I wanted to give you a head start and a chance. You could address the rest of the table and ask, has he been this bad all night? Or you could say nothing and let the dealer deal me in. So. I think I'm going to go with option number two. I wanted to give you a head start and a chance. Farkath says nothing. Neither does anyone else. The big blind this deal is a craftswoman who's replaced her skin with scales and the little blinds Varkarth. You glance at your cards when the bet comes round to you and raise. What's your plan for the evening? And you get five choices again. You can either say you want to win. Why else would I be here? I'm here to talk more than to play. I want to get Wakefield. I don't care about the rest of the game. You want to beat Varkarth. Or you want to taste as many souls as I can and see what you can learn. Well, I am quite competitive, but I think I'm going to go with option two. I'm here to talk more than to play. You make small talk, you play, sure, but you don't take many risks, nor do you try anything particularly ambitious. You aim for report. No one seems to be listening though. Your jokes fall on silence and you can't draw anyone out into conversation. You play a long, losing game, which you expected, and you don't have much fun doing it. But at least it doesn't last forever. The game breaks by unseen agreement and the goddess returns your souls. The dance of cards is done. You rise, stretching against tense muscles, and stagger off to the bar for a drink. Before you travel far, though, you hear a voice behind you, harsh and melodic in weird directions, like a house key straped over a violin string. Ms Cavendish, a pleasure to play with you. You turn and see Varkarth. Sir? His mask is painted to resemble a young man's face. Perhaps his, from a long vanished youth. You think the mask's made of cowhide. You fervently hope that it's made of cowhide. Next time, try to achieve what you set out to do. And you get four options. You can say, I'll remember that, sir. Better to experiment in a casino than a courtroom, sir. Some people are never happy. Or, what were you hoping to see? Well, I don't think I'm going to go with number two. That sounds rude. Don't be rude to the boss. I'm probably going to go with... Number four. What were you hoping to see? Some spark, he says and turns away. You feel exhausted. Long day, long night, and more long days to come. Many more of them, if this life works out the way you've planned. Chen and Pat are talking at the edge of the dance floor. They look like they're ready to go. Meanwhile, the dance itself is heating up, and you see some people there you wouldn't mind heating up as well. Ooh, oh my. And there is always the bar. Not to mention your bed, though it seems so far away now. And you get four choices. You can either go catch up with Chen and Nagab and walk with them to the trolley. Or you can try and get them to stay out for drinks. You can go and dance on the dance floor. Or you can go home and get some rest. I think I'm going to take the first option and go and catch up with my friends. 
you walk your fellow associates to the trolley. Pat won a decent amount of soul at Blackjack, and while Cass didn't gamble, she's a bit out of it from the booze. You part at Hub Station, friends under the streetlights. When you finally reach your apartment, you fall into bed like a piece of broken glass, a memory tumbling, spinning forever in the night. Well, okay guys, that is the end of the first chapter. So, I think I might leave it here and I will upload the next part, the interlude, next time. So thank you all for watching and listening and um, please do leave a thumbs up and a comment if you enjoyed the video. Leave a comment even if you didn't enjoy the video. Tell me what I need to do to improve. Um, please subscribe if you want to see more from me and from the mister as well. So I will see you all next time and thank you for listening. Bye!